tongue-cracking agonies. Again, we're back to the Luke 19 passage. And the foul waters that swell your body to make it rise up like a hedgerow, blocking your eyes. The stomach is so big you can't see over it. And then the counterfeiter answered. So you can see this exchange. Notice, this is a kind of bizarre dialogue that mirrors in some ways Plato's dialogue. Right? A, a, an exchange in Plato's dialogue. Maybe we, we can think uh, uh, about, uh, for example, um, the Crito, where Socrates and Crito are going back and forth with each other. Oh, we notice here it's, it's insulting back and forth, right? And then the counterfeiter answered, Thus, disease, as usual, spreads your gaping jaws. For if I suffer thirst or feel distress, engorged with humors, you burn, your head aches hard, and you would lick. Narcissus's looking glass water, in other words, without delay for too many a word of invitation, if only you could. Wow. By the way, that metamorphosis Narcissa uh, line is from Metamorphosis 3, 407 to 515. By the time you finish reading Dante's Inferno, you pretty much have gone through most of the major stories of Ovid's metamorphoses. I listened to them intently. Dante, he's totally into this, right? It's the way that, for example, some of us have a, a guilty pleasure of watching silliness on TV when people are going at it. And we know it's all silliness, and you know, or it's that silly, that wrestling stuff where we know that it's all kind of contrivance and fake. And yet, many of us still want to watch it. He says, I listened to them intently. Then I heard my master. Now we're going to go back to the beginning of 29. So the, the, the two cantos come together brilliantly. Remember the beginning of 29. Virgil said to Dante, knock it off. You need more focus here. Stare a little longer, he said, and I will quarrel with you. This is with Virgil. Stare a little longer, he said, and I will quarrel with you. In other words, enough with the watching, this silliness. When I heard him speaking to me in anger as he had, I turned to him with such a feeling of shame that it still circles through my memory. Of course, notice, we ourselves as readers have been watching this as well. Are we supposed to feel a certain kind of shame that we're so attracted to some of this? I think Dante is challenging us. That it still circles through my memory. As one who dreams, he is harmed, may in the dream wish that it were a dream, and therefore he longs for the thing that is as if it were not. It's an amazing simile. So I, Unable to speak, was yearning to say something, to excuse myself. And by doing that, I did excuse myself at the same time as I was failing to do it in my thought. And now, a greater fault would be cleansed by lesser shame than yours a moment ago, the master said. So, let your sadness be disburdened. Come, do not forget, I am always at your side. Should fortune bring you again to where you hear people who are arguing as those two dead, wanting to hear them, is a low desire. Don't engage in this kind of thing back and forth. By the way, notice the lines. Do not forget. I have said that if you want to reduce all of Dante's understanding of sin, it is the only sin is to forget. Very interesting, right? Don't forget. In the future, he says, when you're back. All right, let's do quickly now levels two and three here uh, at 2A. Well, the worst fraud, of course, affects the most people, and counterfeits, therefore, are some of the worst. The sights, the sounds, the smells of hell... All of them create this cacophony, this sensual attack. Which one do you, for you is the most compelling? Maybe for Dante, he thinks it might be thirst. How about this one? When you counterfeit or you falsify, or you falsify, you lie, you cheat, you're actually somehow destroying your own identity. We've heard this one before. You become less of who and what you are. And of course, finally, you shouldn't be too attracted by other people's drama wanting to fight. This is an interesting line given our idea given that we're in a high school setting where if two people start going at it, everyone seems to kind of want to engage. Think about how social media fans this foolishness and you can hear Virgil saying to Dante the Pilgrim and therefore to anyone that would want to engage in that. Just knock it off. You don't need to always be wasting your time with that kind of foolishness. Well, the symbolism, I mean, it's an amazing thing, right? The counterfeit coins, a broken soul, the rivers and the fountains symbolizing the longing for thirst. But more, I mean, think about those swollen bellies. It's an amazing symbol, and it takes us back to the Trojan horse of Virgil's Aeneid. Amazing. The ironies, of course, is that Sinon ends up here, right? The great liar of the, of the Aeneid, here he is, right? His punishment. And he's still combating with language, right? Dante is poet, 
well. I mean, using finally Christ's story so late into the Inferno. Anybody that would pick up Inferno would expect Luke 16 to be somewhere near the beginning of the poem. No, no, Dante, brilliant, bringing it to the end. Dante the politician, well, one more time. Notice he jacks the CNEs in this one. Why Florence, why Italy is so messed up again. That longing for greed and the inability to solve the problem. And yet notice in the poem, Dante himself is still wanting to make sure his family gets proper revenge. Later in the poem, the Divine Comedy, Dante the pilgrim will come to understand conflict resolution cannot happen through that kind of violence. It just doesn't work. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. You'll remember Gandhi and M.O.K. said. Finally, Dante is philosopher. This is interesting. To be someone you're not is the worst lie. This takes us back to the Delphi Oracle, Know Thyself. Or does Socrates' um, um, comments in Plato's Apology, The unexamined life is not worth living. Notice that we've even got that referencing of Narcissus and the water as being a mirror. In other words, Dante is suggesting, look into this text and see for yourself what's necessary for your own learning. It's compelling. At 3A, well, obviously, Ovid's Metamorphosis. I mean, I've had students that say, I'm going to go and just read that poem because of, because of all the references. Um, of course, think about it. Homer celebrates the liar and the counterfeit until he doesn't, right? Odysseus is the greatest liar, and yet uh, Antinous and the rest of them, uh, of the suitors, uh, Homer has great disdain for. Interesting, right? And you could make the argument that in the end, when Odysseus hacks off the head of the priest, the reason he does it is because the priest has engaged in counterfeiting and lying. Fascinating. Virgil, of course, will provide a sign-on, so we have those references. I mentioned Conrad's Heart of Darkness. I mentioned Camus' The Plague. T.S. Eliot's Wasteland comes to mind. These are all 20th century texts which somehow try to take Dante and bring him into the 20th century. We'll get there when we study it. Finally, at 3B, which is the worst of these punishments so far? Is it eternal thirst or itching? Um, and what, what are some of the, again, we, we asked this as we set this lecture up, what are some of the sins that you're surprised have not been dealt with? And now we are at the end of this poem. We're coming now to circle number nine, the very end of the poem. What was a time, you knew this was coming, right? What was a time you pretended to be someone else? And do you think of that as a sin? You picked up your friend's phone and texted as them, for example. Is that, is that a sin? Is that wrong? How about T.S. Eliot's Proof Rock? Remember these lines? Yeah, that each day we prepare a face to meet the faces that we meet, or Dunbar's we wear the mask. Do you think it's true that we often try to fool others through some sense of counterfeiting or showing something other than who we are? When was the time you were fooled by another's mask? And do you have a sense that maybe sometimes when we ask people, how's it going, and they say, it's going great, maybe it's not going so great. Well, there you go. That is the uh, eighth circle. We're now on to the ninth circle in Canto 31, the prison of traitors. Um, uh, the worst, according to Dante, and why, we'll get to. I hope this study has been challenging to you as it has been for me. Thank you.